From Reminder Media, this is Stay Paid, a sales and marketing podcast on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business. Hosted by the VP of Marketing, Josh Steik, and Reminder Media's president, Luke Akery. So get ready to hear the golden nuggets that will allow you to live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. Welcome to another Silver Dollar episode of Stay Paid, the best sales and marketing tips of your week in 15 minutes or less. My name is Joshua Stike. And I'm Luke Akery. And before we dive into this episode, I want everyone just to take a second, think about a great leader in your life. It could be in your job, maybe a sports team that you played on, maybe a civic organization you're part of. What qualities do they possess? How do they make you feel? How do they inspire you? These are all things that anyone can learn, no matter what official role you have within your business. And these aren't things you have to be born with. With a little bit of study and intentionality, anybody can be a leader. And we've selected these five tips on how to become a great leader. Yes. Uh, Well, I put these down from two lenses. One is the lens of people in my life that I go, man, these are the things that I've seen in them that have propelled me in my journey. And what is leadership? Leadership is helping others achieve the things in their life that they're after, Mm. right? And helping them see things they can't see. Um, and these are things I've seen and then also things that we've implemented and things that I've seen work in practice. Yeah, absolutely. We have about 300 employees. So, you know, (laughs) it's crazy. uh, It's nuts. (laughs) It's weird to say, but to, um, see it in practice and go, okay, yeah, that is something that I want in the leaders in our organization. And I've seen it work when I've led people. So the first one is uh, something that was popularized by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin, or maybe even created by them, this idea of extreme ownership. So having the quality of extreme ownership, there's no one else to blame. You must own your problems along with the solutions. Commit to lead up and down the chain of command. Uh, We really go into depth of this whole idea because he actually spoke at one of our team uh, events uh, in episode 188, how to apply extreme ownership to your business. But it's baked into our core values, this idea of taking ownership of whatever it is that you're working on. Yeah, I think it's super important. I think when you are following someone, right, you want to see that they actually take ownership for their decisions, ownership for what they're trying to execute on. There's nothing nothing worse, I think, than having someone who literally is making decisions, but they don't even own whether it's not it's going to work or not. And I've experienced this a little bit in my career where it's just like we try something that someone does and that they told us to do. And then they act like they didn't tell us to do it. And it's a terrible, terrible feeling. So you have to not only own what you've actually implemented for your people, but more importantly than that, it goes deeper that even the failures of your team, even if they aren't what your failures are, it's not like your execution, not your plan, but they made a mistake. That's still your problem. Like there's no one to blame, but the leader, it's always the leader. And I think about us at Reminder Media here, and there's been so many things that we've gone through where it's just like, I'm just like, man, that I don't feel like that technically is my fault, but it is my yeah. fault. Like, and, and you have to function in that mentality that it all stops and all it falls and rises with leadership, I think, as John Maxwell says. And once you have that mentality and you have that humbleness, it's really humility. Yeah. That's really what will propel you and being able to reach people. Well, definitely check out the book, Extreme Ownership, or go look back and listen to that episode because we give some, or I guess in the book, there's some solid, solid examples, mm-hmm. not just from a super interesting standpoint from the military career of, of the two authors, but also from the literal business standpoint that they saw examples where exactly what you're talking about, a leader didn't take extreme ownership versus ones who did. The second tip is to lead by example. So this idea of guiding others through your behaviors, inspiring them to do the same as you, when you lead by example, ultimately you're creating a picture of what is possible. Yeah. It's it's super powerful. I'll use my brother as an example. So Steven, you guys know he has like seven agents on his team now, real estate uh, agents. And you know, the agent's basically struggling. He was struggling to get people to make calls because calls are hard. Like they're hard for anybody, right? To pick up the phone and be dialing, making those calls. And he realized, man, I need to get back in and make the calls. And he has everybody now, they're doing this class, this bold class he's taking people through, sitting in a circle, making calls, and he's making calls himself. But here's the reason I'm sharing this story is because he shared with me in the car a really, really powerful point. He said, one of the things about being the leader is I feel the same thing they feel like the, that fear of making the call, the, I don't know what it's going to happen. I'm going to get rejected. All the things, the reasons, oh, this person's not a buyer, whatever it is. I feel that all too. But 
I'm going to get in and do it because I need to show them it can be done. And that translates to action in other people. And so when you lead by example, not only does it build obviously that rapport with your team, they believe in you more, but it also is a super powerful thing to actually drive results. Yeah. Like when yeah. you're when you're stagnant, get in there and actually lead by example and do the work with them and you will have better results. Absolutely. You, you got to get your hands dirty. A couple of things to think about is leading by example based on what you say. So watching what you mm. say as well, respecting the chain of command, listening to the team uh, is a huge one. And then ultimately taking responsibility goes a long way in a leadership position. The third one being uh, communication. So something that you pointed out here, obviously, is setting the clarity of yep. the mission and the vision, uh, and then also radical candor, uh, you know, implementing radical candor, which we can yep. get into. In just a I think bit. the most important um, skill set probably in leadership is the ability to communicate, mm. to communicate clearly, concisely. And what I've realized over time as my maturity as a leader is realizing, wow, Luke, you think you're clear, but it's kind of like the telephone example. If someone whispers something in your ear, they whisper it to the next person and so on and so forth. And by the end, it gets misinterpreted. You've got to be super clear in your communication. You've got to be repeating that communication over and over and over again to be a great leader. And then ultimately, you've got to be willing to speak the truth. I put down radical candor in this because great leaders don't run away from the truth. They don't hide what the feeling is. They don't, they, they address things, right? They don't shy away from it. They don't sugarcoat things because all you're doing is a disservice one to that team member and a disservice to you. So if you can be really clear and concise, everybody knows what I'm talking about when it comes to not really wanting to address something that's happening. <laughs> everybody knows that feeling. You got to knock that off. Be clear mm -hmm. in that. You will earn respect. Yeah. of the people when you are clear and concise with them. Yeah. Um, so Radical Candor was a book written by Kim Scott. She headed up Google ad services yeah. there for a while. She was um, in Apple University. So she's been a, a around in terms of Silicon Valley in, in leadership. And this is what she basically learned from it. So what you want to think about, if you're not familiar with the term, the idea of being uh, radically candid is a uh, picture, uh, a quadrant or an, or two axes, right? So two, two arrows, uh, one going up and one going to the right at the top of the vertical axis is this idea of caring personally for the people on your team, for the individuals that you need to give feedback to. And then to the far right of the horizontal axis is this idea of challenging directly. So where you want to be is you want to be in the upper right quadrant. Cause that's where you're caring personally for the person as well as challenging directly. The example uh, and, and this ultimately will create trust and produces fundamental change. But the example I think is this idea of if someone has spinach in the teeth, right? I kind of walk through each one of these. I think it's really interesting because you, <laughs> you think about this as you are listening to it to say, okay, what quadrant do I tend to fall into? So in the lower right hand quadrant, this is where you are challenging directly, but not caring about the person. This is, will ultimately create defensiveness in the people that you're approaching because you're probably going at it very aggressive without showing them that you care for them. If someone had spinach in their teeth, the example here is you would laugh out loud, point at Michelle and say, look at this. Has she ever floss in her life? Oh my God, get that piece of spinach out of your teeth. So that's this idea of being obnoxiously aggressive. In the lower left, you've got manipulative insincerity, silent, and you don't care. So this is, you want to be silent to be liked or to fit in, which ultimately creates mistrust. This would be the example you whisper to your friends. Can you believe the spinach she has in her teeth? Does she even look in the mirror? Does she even fall? So it's mm. kind of not addressing the problem with her, but not caring enough about the person where you'll go behind their back and talk about it. Upper left is ruinous empathy. This is probably where most people fall into. You're silent. You don't address the problem because you want to avoid hurting the people's feelings, which ultimately creates ignorance in the person that you need to address because then they don't know what's going on. Uh, you uh, Let's say the example of this for the spinach, you think you don't want to make her feel bad, so you don't say anything. It's not a big deal. She'll figure it out. Yep. How often that have is you the fallen number one. into that trap as a leader yep. or someone even in relationships? And you, know, you justify it. Everybody justifies it with kindness. Everybody's like, well, you know, I, I care about it. I don't want to hurt her feelings. I don't want to say anything. I don't, you know, I don't want to make her feel bad. In the upper right, the final example is what we talked about, radical candor. You care personally and challenge directly. Grab Michelle by the elbow, take her to the side, say, hey, Michelle, I'm sorry to be the one to tell this to you, but you have a giant piece of spinach in your teeth. I just, I know I would want to know, so I want to let you know before we head into the big meeting. It's that simple in terms of being able to challenge, you know, and, and uh, give feedback directly, but also care personally. Yep. It's literally that conciseness, that ability to deliver clarity, but do it in a nice way. You Absolutely. can show kindness. Number four is to give recognition. So this is a yeah. big one. This, this is the one. one I probably have been critiqued on that I'm the worst at. 
believe yeah, it or not. You never recognize me. I know. <laughs> I can't tell if that's real or not. No, I'm just kidding. No, but th- this is probably true. The um, one that I've probably been critiqued at the most. It's you got to recognize both the small wins and the big wins. And I think I do a, a good job of recognizing maybe big wins, but not small wins. And giving recognition is more than just rewarding people. And this is where I really fall down on performance metrics. Mm. So I think we as leaders have a tendency because we have a mission. So we recognize people on just performance metrics based upon accomplishing that mission, which seems obvious and logical, but there's so many other things that contribute to success of a mission that you need to recognize. And it could be as simple as someone's attitude or simple as the way someone has been treating someone else and pointing those things out to inspire them. And so, uh, you know, no, I was joking with you. The, this is the one that I fall into the most. Absolutely. hundred percent. And, and I can make the excuse that, well, I'm just so busy on trying to get the next thing done that, you know, I don't think about it, but it's really not an excuse as a leader. A couple of ways that you can uh, really get the most out of giving recognition, make it timely. So give recognition as soon as possible after the performance takes place, be specific, tell people exactly what they did. That was good. Uh, that really solidifies it in their minds that that was um, what led to the results or the positive uh, effect of what they did. Being sincere, so doing mm-hmm. giving insincere praise is usually worse than none at all. Make it personal. Adjust the style based on person. So some people yep. like public pr- praise. Some people get really embarrassed about public praise, and those would be people that you would want to give that praise in, uh, in private. And it's okay to ask. Right. It's okay to mm. ask people That's a great how they, point. How they That's prefer a great to receive point. that. Focus on individuals over groups. So a lot of times this is one where I fall into where I tend to like recognize the whole group as opposed to the individuals and then making it proportional. So you want to match the amount of recognition recognition that you give to the achievement. Going overboard for small stuff can make I had a, question and, your motives. I had an employee. Um, they're no longer with us. Maybe this is the reason <laughs> where I recognized two people that for for something that I forget what it was, it was a project or something like that. Two people, I didn't realize the other employee mm. was, um, you know, um, a part of it and I didn't recognize them. And that obviously hurt their feelings, but it gets worse than that. This is me. This is like uh, confessions with Luke. <laughs> so then what happens was I had reached out to him. I apologize. I called him perf- personally and, and, you know, thanked him and everything. And I guess I had mentioned, you know, I'll, you know, definitely want to mention you to the team. And, I, and then I forgot at the next like meeting. And That's tough. yeah. And then That's it came tough. in, it came in the exit interview. He said he was going to recognize me and he didn't. And that's how powerful recognition can be. Now, obviously, there's other factors at play there. But the point being is like, you know, don't underestimate small compliments, caring about people, recognizing their work and what they're doing. Now, 100 percent. And the fifth one that we have here, I'm curious to kind of get your take on this, is this idea of giving trust. Yeah. So I think where leaders tend to fall down is they want to they started off in the position doing the work. And then they rose up to leadership. And so they still, in a way, want to do the work. Mm. And so this is where the concept of micromanaging gets brought up is you want to micromanage the people who are doing the work, not because you're even thinking, oh, I can do it better than you or something like that. I don't think most leaders ever think that. They just subconsciously are exuding that because they haven't let go and let that person do it themselves. And actually let that person, what I would say is fail. You need to give trust enough to somebody that's on your team to have the freedom to fail. You need to give someone the trust enough to allow them to implement their idea. Now, you're still going to want to deliver clarity of vision and mission, clarity of radical candor if you think it's a bad idea. All those things still apply. But I think giving trust is like the number one foundational. And I think it's, um, what's his name? I can never pronounce his name, Patrick Leasoni or whatever. He talks about five dysfunctions of a team and you cannot build a great team without trust. Yeah. And trust comes from that ability for the leader to both give it, right? Yeah. And and be able to all lick up. Well, I think what you're saying there is like the idea of like uh, giving the feedback if you think it's a bad idea versus giving the feedback whenever you've been there before and something didn't work. Like if you are making sure that they're learning or or communicating with them from experience, like that's one yeah. thing. Uh, versus like, even if you don't necessarily, it's not how you would have done it, let them try it, let them succeed or fail. And then let them take, there's a difference, right. There's a difference between giving ideas to Ariel or trying to 
run everything that Ariel does. I'm just using you as an example, Ariel, because you're here in the room. But <laughs> the point being, it's very clear. It's I either trust Ariel to produce Stay Paid or I don't. Right. And it's we very have clear. no idea what yeah, we're doing. I was going to say, come on back, <laughs> yeah, yeah. guys. Let's There's see no it. way. Well, <laughs> we did it once. We it was a, easy to let go of the trust there because no idea. But yeah. the point being is. After they had to tell us for five minutes it, how to do it. Leaders so often, it, they struggle to let go, myself included. You struggle to let go or you struggle to let that person do their job. And this is why they always talk about you got to hire people that are smarter than you. You shouldn't be the smartest person in the, in the room, meaning you should have trust in the people that you've hired to do the job. Absolutely. So there you go. There are our five tips to becoming a great leader. Thank you so much for listening. You can head on over to statepaidpodcast.com for the show notes, as well as the video of this episode. If you uh, like this episode and you want to support the show, there's two ways that we ask you to do that. First is to head on over to Apple Podcasts, drop us a five-star review along with a comment to let us know how we're doing. And the second way is to tell a friend about the podcast. Uh, So every once in a while in a leadership position, you know, you might make a mistake and you have to apologize. So this week's dad joke is themed around apologies. What do you call an apology written in dots and dashes? A remorse code. <laughs> a remorse code. <laughs> if you want to get hold of me or Luke, you can email us at podcast at remindedme.com. And of course, you can find us on Instagram. We are Ask Tape Paid Podcast. Submit your favorite dad jokes. We went through a spell there where I was getting a lot of dad jokes submitted to us. I was able to read some of them on the show. And that was fun. The one person who continuously sends me them is Sean Carpenter. So shout out to Sean Carpenter again. And of course, you can check out Reminder Media on social media. We are at Reminder Media on every platform. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Stike. Guys, and I'm Luke Acree. And here's my challenge to you is find someone that you have influence on, right? Because leadership is influence, according to John Maxwell, and recognize them recognize them for something, apply what Josh said, right? It needs to be sincere. But I think that's a really simple action item out of these tips that you can implement and it will make a huge difference in your relationships and in your leadership skills. Remember the difference between top producers and mediocre producers is top producers take action. Take action on that today. 